you got to work with some interesting people um, on the book. You got to work with uh, Andrew Provert and Mike right. as well. Yeah. And how, how did you find working with the boys? Oh, uh, both of them were just wonderful. And, uh, um, you know, I was constantly humbled at, at how creative they are and uh, how much continuity meant to them and uh, how much, you know, doing right by Star Trek meant to them. That that really struck me. And uh, so I was, I was honored to be able to work with them. And uh, I had my own ideas now and again in doing the book of how I thought things should be. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that Andy got exasperated with me because I would say, well, I think it would be better, be better if I did it this way. And he's like, <laughs> no, it needs to be like this. And and sometimes I went along with what he said, and sometimes I didn't. And I'm sure I I, I must have been very frustrating to work with. But um, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, both of them were just just amazing and uh, um, uh, so helpful and so just brilliant in their ideas and suggestions. And um, you know, the, the the book is is far better for their having been, having been involved than it would have been otherwise. I, I, I think. Yeah, I think when you look at the book, it's, it's kind of funny because the way that you were going about to create this book, you know, you're saying when you're measuring tape and your ruler and so forth like that, you really wanted to give the fans an accurate portrait of the Enterprise the interior. And yeah, gas, I, I did. We, we, like going from interviews with Andrew and uh, Mike, like, as you said, they were exa- they had the exact same mentality. Like, you know what I mean? They wanted stuff to look right and you can mm-hmm. see it down the lines that there's a progression of technology and so forth like that and the kudograms kind of follow suit as well which is like right. it's great that like star trek kind of got into the hands of people like yourself and mike like i know you just did the book but you brought the book and you brought pieces elements from the star trek movies into a fan's hand and they could like you know go through because there's fantastic illustrations of like the uniforms. I'm not going to too upset that the motion picture uniforms might have been left out, but <laughs> the more modern uniforms from uh, Star Trek 2, like the phaser, like there's, there's lots of the, the, the engine room, the transporter pads, and like y- you've got it all scaled. And, you know, that's that's kind of fantastic for a fan just to kind of, you know what I mean? It's, it, it's just a well, beautiful, put together book. Like, um, you know, pictures of the... The, the, the shuttle pods and, and stuff like that and you know for me it was kind of like I remember kind of when I first looked at the book kind of figuring out places of what everything was kind of caused uh, or the trusters and so forth like that so uh, you know, like it is it, it, it's fantastic and it, it's well done so like that kind of precision that you actually put into it well, and thank you like just uh, coming to think about it, like the book is nearly 30 years old next year will be 30 years old and myself and Damien like we've seen this come up now twice where uh, we'd ask the fans questions and your book is still referenced like you know it's 30 years on and I've got two examples now and I'm just going to read like this is this is still and this is one's a month old and one is actually a week old so there you go but like there was a one of our fans limping no put down I can't remember oh yes we mentioned about the Yorktown hmm and uh, we really don't know if the Enterprise A was former Yorktown. That's speculation. If it is, it's hard to believe that Starfleet was able to get her back to Space Dock, install a new bridge module, and give her to Kirk and company. Close up images of the displays on the bri- bridge published in Mr. Scott's Guide to the Enterprise show the A had transwarp, for example. Uh, none of that really goes well together. So there's one example of the book coming back out. And there was another great one because, as we said, we covered uh, Star Trek 3. Um, last time we were covering our movies and the whole thing about the self-destruct uh, we uh, call right. it kind of uh-huh. weak self-destruct and a quick explanation uh, this was from uh, Simmons 8519 a quick explanation avoid the destruction of the Enterprise in Happens the way it does as given by Mr. Scott's Guide to the Enterprise published in 1987 <laughs> it turns out the Federation Starships uh, of this era had two destruct modes the last two words in the destruct command where Destruct 1, uh, the uh, electromagnetic containment field inside the antimatter pods, would be deactivated, resulting in the type of destruction seen in Star Trek Generations. However, if the code 0 was given, the antimatter pods and warp core would be ejected to a safe distance before the remaining 
uh, power to them was exhausted, the ship's remaining power would overload, destroying all computer-related systems and detonation packs positioned at critical areas of the ship would render the hull unusable and the ship's systems enabled. There you go. So there's there's right. two, you know what I mean? And that's like no. one's a month ago and one's a week ago. So 30 years oh. later, Star Trek fans are kind of still using, when it comes down to the Enterprise, uh, the refit or the A, it's kind of the Bible. <laughs> uh, well, I'm honored that, that, that people still think so highly of it. And I'm honored to have been in some way, you know, a part of uh, uh, Star Trek lore. Um, there are some things about the book that I would change. I, mean, I can say that about every book I've ever done. But um, back at the time that I wrote it, um, again, it was 86. And so it was very early on in um star trek marketing there really just wasn't much out there and there never had been um and so there was a book that had come out at the same time as the motion picture called the spaceflight chronology which i liked very much and i still like it very much and um there was another um uh, publication done, which is my favorite Star Trek publication of all time, even now, um, the Star Trek maps that Bantam published. Um, just absolutely gorgeous. They look like something National Geographic did. I mean, they're just beautiful. And uh, um, there were the FASA materials, the gaming materials. They mm. were licensed um, by Paramount. And so when I did Mr. Scott's Guide, Paramount contacted me and asked me to maintain continuity with those, with what had gone before. They wanted continuity with the spaceflight chronology. They wanted continuity with FASA. They asked me to incorporate those materials into my book. And I'm like, okay. So that's why in a lot of places, Mr. Scott's Guide mentions um, uh, contractors and events and dates that um, appeared in the FASA materials. And in the spaceflight chronology, because spaceflight chronology follows the 200-year timeline rather than the 300-year, which ultimately was established, especially going forward from Next Generation. Hmm. Um, so if I were able to go back and redo the book, um, uh, do a revision of it, which I, I wanted to do about 10 years ago, but it was a very bad time for Star Trek, and they, they weren't interested hmm. um, in doing that, but – I would have to um, update the timeline, bring it into line with everything that has happened since then. Um, that, that seems to be m most people's major complaint about the book is that the timeline is does not match um, what we've seen in all these other publications since then. Like, well, yes, I know, but there's a reason mine's different. It's because it was it was first, it was different, mm -hmm. and uh, all those changes came after, so I had no control over that. But um, – so anyway, I would uh, uh, love to go through and make the book um, more cohesive uh, with everything that has, has gone since. Um, but I, I do hear that from people. You know, a lot of people say that, you know, that my book was the first Star Trek book that they ever had or, or that, you know, that they still have a copy that they – go through that's you know kind of torn up down through the years but that, that's you know, still on the shelf and and all of this so i just i'm so grateful and so honored to hear that from people Excellent. i don't know like when, when, when you look back at the book even like as chris is saying there it's going to be 30 years soon like just the quality and caliber of the content in it um you touched on how much research and how much effort you put into it and working mm -hmm. with some fantastic um people like mike and um, andy as well but it's just it's an amazing collection of information and like it, it it's hard for me to comprehend the amount of research that you went that went into it and yes you know um there there may be opportunities there to kind of update it as well but it has so stood the test of time and it's it is amazing that people are still talking about it even like as chris was saying there like a week ago people are commenting on our videos mm -hmm. referencing it as well and i know i'd be one of those people you know very eager to have you kind of come back work your magic on it as well maybe bring it up to the 160 uh, page <laughs> you know or more that would be nice thank you i mean but back at the time that i wrote the book yeah at the There's time that else. i wrote it uh there um 
there weren't that many people that involved in Star Trek technology and the ones who were, were focused primarily on, on Franz Joseph and, and what he had done. Now you've got all kinds of wonderful people with all kinds of wonderful you know ideas like like um, the you know Trek Yards and Facebook. I mean they some of the things that these people put out there and propose just brilliant. I mean they're just just some just some amazing stuff. Um, but at the time that I wrote this book, um, there were an awful lot of gaps to fill. Um, you have to go kind of behind the walls. You have to, you know, because basically the Enterprise is just a curved corridor and a few rooms, and that's it. You know, in real life, there's not that much to it. So you have to go in and fill in behind the walls. You have to fill in the gaps. And back then, there was an awful lot of gap filling to do. And I had to look at, you know, sometimes there'd be one line in a movie that they just kind of threw out there, and then I'd have to ex- figure out a way to explain it. You know, like when. In the first movie, they had new shields. You know, I mean, you know, Sulu said the new shields held, you know, when when V'ger shot at them. So I knew that this was a new shielding system. They had a new warp drive system. They had a new phaser system. But it was just mentioned, but there was really no real explanation behind any of this. And so one, well, for, just for an example, one of the things that I had to uh, address are the were the shields on that ship because every other ship, every other station, every other everything that it encountered, Viger had basically basically gotten eaten, and the Enterprise comes in with these shields that it has and fends off, you know, the first bolt that comes from Viger. I mean, it takes a, a huge toll on the the you know the power supply in the ship, but it does hold it off at least for that one time. So I'm thinking this has to be a really, really special shielding system. Something has to be really different about it mm. because the Klingons couldn't stop it and the space station didn't stop it and um, nobody else apparently ever had. And I started thinking about it and that was when I came up with the system that I described in the book, um, a new way, a new shielding system, way that the, the Enterprise's shields work, that they would take um, – a sample of a material, a very, very hard material, and that they would replicate it as energy outside of the ship to ba- basically create a uh, um, uh, a new um, hull layer, basically, that would surround the ship like a cocoon with a very small space between it and the, and the actual hull. And it would be plan- replenished as long as the, the, the power was there and as, and as long as the power drain coming from outside wasn't so great that it couldn't keep up and couldn't couldn't replenish it sufficiently. And um, so I was thinking and I thought about that episode, um, That Which Survives, when Spock was talking about the this Kalandan alloy called Dibernium Osmium that was, you know, re- phasers didn't touch it. It was just, you know, the hardest thing that he'd ever seen. And so I thought, okay, well, Spock, you know, he studied this with his tricorder. He probably took, you know, analyzed the, the molecular structure of it, took it back. And so I proposed in the book that Starfleet had taken this Dibernium osmium alloy and had incorporated it into a new shielding system. So basically you were encasing the ship in, in an electronic um, form of this alloy that could be replenished for as, you know, as long as the power could hold up and as long as it, whatever was attacking didn't get ahead of it. And um, so, you know, I, I wrote that and I was very happy with that explanation. It was never canon until um, Into Darkness. Um, and, and Mr. Scott's Guide is the only place that I'm aware of that, it, who, that has ever mentioned the Dibernium Osmium thing in connection with shields. But in Into Darkness... As uh, the Vengeance is attacking the Enterprise, there's a graphic that comes up on the main screen, and it says shield strength, and underneath it, it says Dibernium Osmium 6%. So they made me canon. So I'm, like, very happy about that. I I didn't even see that. That is awesome. I can can send you a link. Yeah, there there was a link online. (laughs) Uh, The people who did the graphics for the movie put their graphics online, and you can see it. And it's just, oh, it's just brilliant. So... You were made canon. Yay! I'm official. Yeah, I'm official. <laughs> that's, that's, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing to see that, like, 
as, as you said, you mentioned the boys from Trek Yards and the way how they pull apart chips and they go through them and all that. And then, you know, we're grateful to have, of course, yourself that did this book 30 years ago. And you know what I mean? Try and put explanations and stuff. Because, like, unfortunately, like with some things, you know what I mean? What a, a, a director might want to go ahead with and do compared right. to, say, maybe a from a production point where Mike would turn around and go, oh, my God, what have they done? Because that doesn't fit into canon or anything like that. Or, you know, this kind of like, it's just let the fans sort it out. And then this whole right. auction explodes and people are arguing and saying, no, that's not what this is about. So it's great to see people like that showing the interest and trying to figure things out. Because we even had Sean come back and uh, Sean explaining about the, the Franklin. You know what I mean? And like the theories were bouncing around about the Franklin and he turned around, I think, with Damien and, and he classed it as a cargo ship. And then we also had, uh, I think, Justin Lynn at the same time had mentioned that it was a Mako ship. So then it kind of, you know what I mean? It, everything kind of together then, you know what I mean? It was a, it was a Mako cargo mm-hmm. ship, which was kind of fit perfectly into Star Trek uh, history, okay. which is kind of great. So have you, um, you were saying... Um, you know what I mean? How, how, how do you feel like you, you turned around and you talked about the motion picture and you said that like, you, you know, and I remember actually John was telling us exactly similar things that like you call it. He was at the premiere and he was telling us they were literally, you know, finishing off the film reels when they were putting it on for the premiere. Right. But how did you feel like all of us are like, there's the motion picture and then you had the book with that tight deadline. Do you, do you regret having to do the book or yet? Oh, no, kind of, no, not at all. I mean, I'm, I'll always be grateful for, for having had the opportunity to do it. And the one that followed, I did another one afterward, mm-hmm. a couple of years later, called World of the Federation, which um, didn't really deal with hardware at all, but, but you know, dealt with all these different planets you'd heard of. And it touched on Next Generation, not heavily, but Next Generation was still very early on at the time. So I think there's Ferengi in there, and there's there's a couple of, of other, um, but um, no, I'm, I'm I'm grateful for having had the chance to do it. Now it was. It's one of those jobs where I look back on it and I go, what was I thinking? Because it was a much bigger job, honestly, than I was really prepared to do at the time. But um, with help from Mike and Andy and uh, some great people, I was you know, able to, to get through it and uh, produce something that, that the fans liked. And it was very important to me to, to do a book that would um, – do justice do you know that would honor star trek and not be something that people would look at and and, you know think that you know i hadn't done it right and um so i'm I'm glad that so many people think so fondly of it and that that's very like it is i in my opinion it's ultra high praise as well because star trek fans you know they're the most fanatic about it as well you know it's just the passion that they have for the franchise like the word canon pardon the pun is shot around all the time you know was it on screen right. is it canon is it official and as you mentioned there there wasn't much material back in the mid 80s and like no. you try to you know have a logical plausibility to it and try to honor what we have seen as well and you know seeing it then evolve in that you were then made canon by the next generation of Star Trek movies as well. It's fantastic. Right. It's great to see. Well, that was that was that was something that I I very quickly learned after the book came out, is that everybody has their idea of how things are. And because I started getting letters from people telling me, oh no no no, you messed up. It's not like that. It's like this. <laughs> and so I mean, there was one person wrote me this letter saying that that. Uh, Oh no no! You, you should have put um, seats up in the in the warp nacelles so that um, if the ship was going to blow up, the crew could go up there and get into the warp nacelles and ride away to to be clear, you know, of of, of the trouble. And I'm like, what, you know, I'm thinking, well, if something's going to blow up, the nacelles are probably going to be involved in that, and <laughs> so that's probably not a good place to put seats. But <laughs> but everybody had their own idea. Of, of how things should be in some, yeah. you know, there, there are a few things in here. I, I do wish I had done differently, but, um, uh, you know, given the deadline pressure I was under, I think it turned out okay. And, uh, exactly, yeah. um, and I, and I love, I do love that the fans are so passionate about it, you know, that, that they care enough to, to think about how it ought to be and how the ship should work and, and, and all of that. And 
why do the Klingons have bumpy heads now and whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We should do a petition now, like hashtag, let's um, let's regenerate Mr. Scott's guide. Let's let's do another pass on it or something it, like that. Definitely. I think it'd be cool, especially with the likes of uh, the Polaron uh, 1350 scale model, cause, which is something that actually it's in the background there. It's actually nice. primed. It's primed. I'm waiting on a friend. I had a problem with my lighting kit. That's getting repaired. So it's it's primed. It's the joys. This is my first uh, take on doing proper lighting inside a kit. So, uh, but um, you did some work on this. Um, yes, you yes, credit I did. For it. No, Which... I didn't get credit for it. I did. I did help on the uh, the one the three fiftieth scale refit kit. Um, a few things I designed. Uh, mostly the interior parts. The uh, uh, the hangar deck and the officer's lounge and the botanical garden. Um, and uh, um, had to make a few compromises just, just given the nature of the kit. You know, like, for example, the the hangar deck should be tapered. Right, there you go. The hangar mm-hmm. deck should be tapered so that it's wider at the front than it is at the back. But because of um, the design of the kit... Um, in order to light the windows along the primary, the, along the secondary hall on the inside, I couldn't take the the hanger de- hanger bay all the way out the way I should have. So I had to make it straight and kind of narrow it a bit in order to, to leave room for lighting. Mm. But that's okay. It, I mean, it, it it looks it looks nice as it is. And um, I designed uh, um, the uh, uh, dry dock base part that goes with it because because originally they were just going to have some little simple stand and i said well it's the refit i said it'd be really nice to have something that that represented the dry dock in some way what if we did a you know a a large you know base piece rectangular something that could sit on that looked like the dry dock and so we designed that and uh and and that made it through now i think they've gotten uh, it's it's been modified now but um Tom Sasser, who was the the person I was working with back at the time, um, designed the uh, the little struts that came up, the little clear plastic struts that came up from the base that the Enterprise would sit on, and he made those to look like the warp shaft in the ship, and made the and made them in clear so that if someone wanted to do a warp shaft inside, they had the pieces already. Oh, and if someone wanted to do a cutaway version or something, they would have those already. All they would have to do was use those, and that's why they're designed the way they are—is to look like the warp shaft. Cool. And oh. uh, later on, the later versions, they took those out, and now it just sits on a pole, which is fine too. But um, anyway, that was the thinking behind those early on. Oh, because like you know, I, I've seen it. I was there. Like I, I kind of got the. Not the 50th anniversary edition. I was like, I got the last release. Uh, it was probably just the first re-release of it. And I was wondering, I was glad that I didn't have the stand with the the poles going out. But I didn't realize mm-hmm. that actually now you could actually yeah. use them for the shaft, which is actually that's very, what, very clever. Yeah, that's what they were for. I don't know that it ever got mentioned in the instruction sheet. I know that I never got mentioned in the instruction sheet. Yeah. But, oh, which, um, oh, but you've said it now. And you know what I mean? I think they're, <laughs> you, yeah, I, I don't know if they got... A lot of people have been like, you know, Star Trek fans are like, we want to do this kit. And I think, I know Captain Foley's at the same stage as me. It's just that slow. It It, it is a scary kit to do. Um, yeah, you know, it, is. But it's, 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 it is an intimidating model, but yeah, it, 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 oh, it builds up beautifully. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you do a nice job on it, it's just really, really impressive. I have mine here and I've never built it. You know, I've got the one. I've got the one that Tom sent me, and I've never built it. And you know, I I have nowhere to put it, if I did. <laughs> but it's, it's someday I would like to try. Someday I, I I'll make room for this <laughs> when it, when it's fine. Right. Right. I mean, there are times I think about, wow, I wish that I could go back in time and have this kit to build back for the the door prize for the Ultimate Fantasy instead of scratch building the one I had to scratch build back then. And scratch build. No. So, well, big thing back then and like i think like i suppose when you, you when you when you bring model kits into star trek it's just so, kind of so funny because i think the initial doomsday and there's about two or three episodes of star trek where the story is that like they ended up going down to the model shop and buying two or three enterprises oh yeah and, uh, you know yeah, what i mean that's 
the AM, uh, yeah, the AM team model made it into the actual episodes. Here and there. <laughs> so, um, it's fantastic. You know, dear, I didn't. It's when they later released the kids down the line and they decided to start throwing in all the, you know, I mean, all the names from mm-hmm. the model kits that was oh, were yeah. used on the show. Kit bashing so, all the uh, ships right. for all the battle scenes and stuff like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, I remember I had one of the very first issue kits and back when they had all the lights in it. It didn't have the lights in the nacelles yet, but it just had the lights in the saucer. And you would turn the deflector thing on the front. That was the switch. You'd turn that to turn it on and off. And it had the, the neat triangle, the big triangle base and everything. And uh, um, it was a different mold back then. The, the contours of the kit were different than, the, than they are now. Um, the bridge dome was shaped differently. The, the, everything. The, the primary hull was shaped differently. I, don't, I guess the original molds wore out or something but at some point along the way in the 70s they changed all the molds and uh i much prefer the old kit and the the, the lines that it had to the, the one that they that they have now hmm. but um anyway so that's cool like yeah like it would be hard i i know from watching other like youtube channels and stuff like tested and where they you know fabricate and stuff how they say molds will eventually wear down you can only get so many you know uh, pieces out of each but see I, do, I wouldn't have thought it would have changed it that drastically as well I must go back and actually have a look at it and, and see but it, that's great to have worked on something that cool as well mm-hmm. you know every time you know you say I've done this I've done that it's like oh my god it's, it's amazing but uh, yeah you've had such an impact on Star Trek you know and it must be great oh, well, kind of starting as a fan you know um, that it's not just a oh, job yeah. it's like your book is like a passion project. Well, it comes across as such, mm-hmm. you know, um, deadline be damned, but you, you try to do the best that you can. And yes, there's a couple of things you want to change here and there, but you know, it definitely just comes across as, you know, um, total passion project. And uh, yeah, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. The impact that you've had um, on Star Trek as well. So fair play. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I've My fingerprints are in there here and there, just little things, you know, nothing, of course, like, like Andy or Mike, but just, you know, just little things here and there. You know, one, one thing, back when I was doing this book, I don't remember how it came up, but I was having a conversation with um, Mike Akuda about uh, um, the original, about, about Star Trek The Motion Picture and how nothing much from the original carried over into the movie. It was like almost entirely new. It only been like three years since the end of the five year mission or whatever, but you, you didn't see any of the same uniforms or phasers or ships or, I mean, nothing. It's like everything had changed. Mm. And I think, I think the only prop from the original series, well, outside of Spock's ears, they, they found, they used an actual pair of of, uh, ears from the original show in the, in the first movie. But um, other than that, the only prop that carried over was um, the medical uh, device that uh, Chapel is holding to, to Spock's head in the in sick bay. That that was a piece from the original show, and that was the only thing carried over from the original. And I just mentioned to Mike, I would have liked to have seen more um, reminders that were in that same universe um, than we did. And he's and he said. Uh, was there anything in particular that you miss? And I said, yeah, there's one thing I really do miss. I miss the bridge sounds because it really, it was very unique. It was, it, it, it really had the Star Trek feel, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. the, the sound, the background sounds going on on the bridge, the sensor sounds and, and the button sounds and just everything that was very, very characteristic of Star Trek for me. And I missed that um, uh, in the movies. We had not seen that at all in uh, Star Trek, you know, one, two, or three, and uh, he said that's interesting. And I said, I said, yeah, I, th- I think that that would go a long way toward helping people to, you know, that this feels like Star Trek. Mm. And so I got a very pleasant surprise when Star Trek Four came out, and in that little fifteen or twenty second clip at the end, when they're on the bridge, you hear the old bridge sounds. And Mike had gone and talked to them and said, hey, why don't we put those in there? And they did. So that's one of my little fingerprints. But um, amazing fingerprint. Uh, <laughs> and that's great. Yeah. That actually carried over to Star Trek The Next Generation as well. Because when you think about it, you, you do have the bridge home in The Next Generation, especially as well. 
the engineering, the, the home of the war core, you know, which, and you're so right, you know what I mean? You, you know, it's it's nice to relate to a sound, to a TV show, and mm -hmm. just come to think about it. I think another prop that might have survived was a, a, a hers uh, headpiece. Oh, that's right, you're right. But I yeah. think the only reason behind that was something went wrong with a new prop, and they just happened to find the old one, and they went, that's right. That'll do. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But, oh, yeah I forgot a... about that. You're right. If you, <laughs> no. if you if you if you manage to get some sounds back onto the Enterprise Bridge, which is actually it, it is kind of fairly missing from uh, first three movies, it's nice to have that little home back on the bridge. And, and it's and it's nice. I noticed that on the director's cut DVD, they put some of those back on the Enterprise Bridge in the motion picture, so you hear them now. They weren't there originally, but now you hear them. So that you know they're they're not overt, but they're there. And so that's it's it's nice. It's a nice little subtle way to remind you that you're in the same universe with the same basic technology. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad that they did that. Cause, you know, sound is is a huge part of a movie, just like just like you know what you see is. And um, so I'm I'm glad that they did that. I remember reading um, about the original movies that like the technology that they had for like the screens on the bridge or like these projectors and that they would actually be very loud themselves. So there was right. a huge amount of overdubbing, you know, and, and someone probably just forgot or didn't think it was important to put like the bleeps and bloops in there and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it does go a lot of the way, you know, audio. Um, even like Chris has mentioned there, the hum of the engine room as well. Like there's videos on YouTube. Maybe you've seen the movie or not, but like they're 10 hours long just ship sound <laughs> you know for people to fall asleep to or just have in the oh, background really? as okay. well but um mm -hmm. like They're... even the new movies now yeah like the bridges like okay the new enterprise um it it, it doesn't have the same kind of love or affinity to most fans i do like it myself but it is a bit bright and sometimes brash but it does feel very alive with the audio on it mm -hmm. um let's maybe take a few of the lens flares out it of does. it but um you know it's yeah uh, they went overboard a little bit, <laughs> little bit. Yeah. They, they have dialed it back i must say but um yeah again it's it seems like a living breathing you know you know set um and it's great to see that kind yeah. of coming back as well but yeah awesome well, again, i'll go on the record I love the new movies. I really do. I'm a, I'm a huge fan, especially the first one. You know, I thought it was just amazing. And um, I just, you know, third, I've watched it so many times. And I think they really, you know, captured the spirit of what Star Trek originally was. And, and so um, I know that it's a real bone of contention with a lot of fans. <laughs> but I, uh, I'm... I'm very much a fan of the new ones. So. Chris is laughing here because I, I'm like, I'm I've, I'm known as like the positive Trekkie. I kind of like everything Star Trek, but I'm always kind of uh, saying, you know, I like the movies. I like the Enterprise, and and yes, uh, it's not perfect, but it's great. It's brought a whole new generation to Star Trek, and I just think the casting of it is fantastic. You know, Kirk oh, and yes, Spock absolutely. and spot on. You know, and it's Carl just Irvin, so yeah, Carl Urban is amazing as McCoy. He just, yeah. he just nailed it. Oh, yeah, he plays him to a T. <laughs> oh yeah. I think the one the scene, has... the the one scene that kind of uh, sorry for interrupting you there, Chris, but the one scene that always resonates with me with the new Star Trek is the Kobayashi Maru scene, and um, mm -hmm. when Kirk is just in the chair and he's just eating the apple, and it's just like, that's that's William Shatner right there. Just that everything else I, is good but just that one scene this is like that's perfect I know, and i love that he, that he that they deliberately had him eat the apple to pay homage to the scene in star trek 2 where kirk is sitting there eating the apple yeah. so, it's, yeah. it's great and i love the hands just with the gun i like again like credit to the last one that was released the first one isn't too bad i, I wasn't too sold on the design of the enterprise otherwise not the first one's actually fairly good uh the second one i think they lost it went into dark, darkness a bit but the, the last one now has completely won me over i think it was absolutely fantastic and uh really really enjoyed it and it's good to see again it, it, it's amazing when with star trek and i think it's always a big thing when you get fans involved in star trek not just people that say I'm a Star Trek fan. You, you can actually see when they're genuinely a Star Trek fan. And Simon Pegg, you, you know where he's done the script writing. And what was missing 
has has definitely been put in and the humor right um, so the characters have been definitely brought into this movie which is absolutely brilliant like uh mccoy and spock mm-hmm. i think it's done absolutely spot on um you know and and that's credit that, that's again you can see the essence of a fan to bring that back yeah it, it made yeah. this movie and I think I won a lot of hardcore Star Trek fans over it as well because straight away, like a lot of people turn around and goes, the humor's back. Right. Mm. I love where McCoy sits there and goes, well, that's just typical when Spock beams out. Or, you know, I mean, that was, that was, <laughs> yeah. that was perfect. So, <laughs> Yeah, there was that scene on um, when, the, when, when they're beaming off the uh, Franklin to go on the rescue mission and, he's, and, and Spock chooses... Um, bones to go on the mission as well and he just has those one liners it's just just old yeah. school kirk, original series <laughs> kirk, kirk was brilliant though as well because that's kirk had a line in there and goes what you got like um i can't i can't wait until uh, mccoy hears about this which was real mm-hmm. kind of shatner as well you know it was real kind of captain kirk you right. know I can't wait until he hears about this and like just it, ah, it was brilliant you know what i mean and that, that's what star trek was like i can i think i yeah. think there was an interview there with doug drexter and he turns around he called uh it's the one from the the History Channel. He calls Mr. Scott. He basically ah. calls Scotty McCoy and Kirk as one. Mm-hmm. And when you do think about it, it, it it's kind of like it, it's always those three. The trio, yeah. And it's just to have just that back. Well, for for me, that that you know, Kirk Spock McCoy is Star Trek for me. Yeah. You know, if it doesn't have them, then it's in the Star Trek universe, but it's not Star Trek. You know, if if you know mm. what I mean, and I'm not, I don't say that to demean anything else, but just for me personally, for it to be quote unquote Star Trek, it has to be Kirk Spock McCoy, yeah. and uh, so that's. Um, uh, I think you call it Max Skirt. I think if I can remember, I think you call it, you call it the character Max Skirt. The question oh, was that was uh, favorite character in Star Trek, and Doug tried oh. to be cheeky and called him. Max skirt. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> and just to kind of on, on the kind of the, the subject of the kind of the whole new generation of Star Trek as well. Um, with Discovery on the horizon coming out next year, um, have you seen anything or um, come across anything about Star Trek Discovery, or do you have any thoughts on it? That it, how about it? Just how it's going read, back? Just what I read online. Um, the only real thought that I have about it is I'm not sure how wise it is to set it 10 years before Kirk because that is within the time frame that we've already seen. You mm-hmm. know, the cage was 13 years before Kirk, so this would be three years after the events of the cage, and which should, if it's the same universe, that limits what the uniforms look like, that limits what the technology looks like. Mm-hmm. Because we've already seen Starfleet um, of that era. And so I would think that if they're wanting to do new things, if they're wanting to explore and have some kind of uh, creative freedom, I don't think it's wise to place it there. Because now they're going to be inviting all kinds of criticism if they stray from that too far. I think it would have been better. And again, I, I don't know... I'm not privy to any behind the scenes stuff really. So I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know what the writing is like. I don't, don't know any of that, but I would think that it would have been a wiser move to place it between Star Trek six and next generation somewhere, you know, maybe 20 or 30 years down the road, just someplace to give them the freedom because that's a wide open area that hasn't really been touched. Mm -hmm. And that would give them more freedom to, to explore um, but you know, we'll see. I don't know. Um, mm. I know that they're working on another ship that what we saw was just preliminary and just something to kind of put out there. Yeah. Um, I didn't really care for it, especially in that time frame. It did not at all look like a Federation ship from 10 years before Kirk to me. Um, the, and the proportioning on the ship, I thought that the triangle was too big for the saucer and, um, I don't like the rectangular section nacelles. Um, uh, I, I I think from that era, I think nacelles just really have to be circular in section. Um, but we had a big, we we had a great chat, Laura. There, 
uh, on the Friday, and we're just kind of mentioning that because like you're right specifically, like that the uniforms, um, you know, what I mean, have to be those kind of blue polo kind of heavy tops, like they're not even that we right. see. Because uniforms first... are uniforms are fleet wide. That's not as sh- you know a ship specific thing. So they would be bound to that. Mm. Yeah, and un- no. unless they just unless they just want to, you know. Uh, you know, just, uh, replace it with something else, and but again, then they invite criticism. Yeah, you have, um, to, you have to laser from the cage. You yeah, you know what I mean. Now they can kind of probably maybe somewhere in between, but like it's it it, it is as you said, it's it's three years, so like it doesn't make too much sense that like you have the cage phaser and then you have the the phaser from TOS. You know what I mean? It's it's kind of like all of a sudden they're changing the phasers fairly quickly. Mm-hmm. That like the delta has to be removed, so it is. It's kind of mm-hmm. they are they're leaving themselves in a in a time frame to be criticised. But uh, as I was talking to you, like if the storyline's right and there's a, a good explanation for why the ship looks this way, yeah, you know, it 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 could uh, everyone could be like all of a sudden very very happy. Um, it's it's yeah, fair it's point. we'll we'll have to see what they come up with and the, and their reasoning behind it. Um, I'm yeah. going to be a positive Trekkie. Okay. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's a negative one. <laughs> I try to be. I'm not always. Yeah, it's 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 not too far away from us now. There's still a lot of questions. Um, Mr. Fuller is a very cryptic fellow, and um, I'm still I'm still trying to figure out what this what this event that was referenced in Star Trek oh, is, okay. but never seen. Um, you have your own theories, Chris. Anyway, <laughs> I reckon it's the Tolians. Antonio, the Tolians robbed that ship, and. Uh, they get their sh- they get they get a saucer section back off their ship. <laughs> and it's well, we we do know that we do know that the Federation was aware of the Tholians before we actually saw them because Spock mm. made a comment about the renowned Tholian punctuality, which means that they're well known to everybody. You know, mm. we'd never seen them mentioned any place, but they were known. So who knows? They could have exactly. You know, they could put them in there someplace, and it would fit just fine. Mm. And I'm I'm so. curious to see whether they will kind of go down the path of the new Star Trek movies. Um, Because myself and Chris, like, again, like we've talked to a few people connected with, like, uh, for example, like Sean uh, Hargreaves and um, John Eves. And, you know, the information that, you know, they have uh, given us and, you know, created, like, fantastic discussion over was that obviously we have Star Trek cbs and we have star trek paramount and they were at loggerheads and they couldn't do too much to star trek because again who'd get paid for it would it be paramount would it be cbs but now that we're back in cbs um Mm -hmm. will they will they go down the route of like reimagining star trek and again yes open the door to criticism but you know with current production techniques and storytelling and stuff like that as well will we just see a new stylized Star Trek set within an era that we have already known, you know, will we see, you know, Robert April flying around the universe and stuff like that as well. Again, right. I, I'm I'm kind of holding back and waiting to see when once more information comes up. But um, I, I'm, I'm interested the way it's going, how it's not kind of going to be sitting in the captain's chair of a ship as well. It's going to be mm-hmm. um, a little uh, a few ranks below and it may be more crew based and interesting as well but we, we'll see in january you know be interesting times I, I wonder how it's going to be amazing how we are going to feel if they do show the enterprise and for once it's the opposite side of the screen you know what i mean this is the uss discovery hailing the enterprise and like you know seeing the enterprise on the monitor and maybe captain april or oh right um, yeah captain mm-hmm. Pine, you know that, that'd be so strange you know uh you know what i mean that's that's our old beloved hero ship and no, it's, right. there. it's that like would a, be or even you know the way in the next generation where you know what I mean. Uh, it, the Enterprise D is what you call it, and the hood is pulling off. Like imagine like the discovery there, and there goes the Enterprise off in the distance. Where they're like, yeah, oh, come back. right, yeah. Oh. The interest, but um, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to. It. I think uh, you know, what I mean, I think there is uh, dedicated guys uh, behind this production and. They are well-established Trek fans, hmm. and I'm gonna I'm gonna be positive about. It. I think I, I think they know what they're doing, and I'd say pleasantly please please the fans. I think they'll tick hmm. the right boxes. I'm 
They're not going to let me down. There's no way. <laughs> Excellent. Keep Excellent. a good thought. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, um, not to take too much of your time now, and I really must say, um, I'm hugely grateful for you sharing your day with us today and and coming on to talk. Um, Mr. Scott's guy to the Enterprise and um, everything around it as well. So there's Chris holding it up as well. <laughs> Fantastic. But, um, you know, um, just kind of wrapping it up there. Do you want to say anything to anybody watching at home that's probably sitting there clutching their book or reminiscing when they may have had the original one and uh, maybe something happened it as well? But we do know there's an avid fan base out there for you already, Laura. Well, thank you. I do just want to say that I'm grateful. Um that the book was received as well as it was and that the fans still um, consider it worth reading and uh, um, I'm honored and and humbled that the that the fan base and and uh, um, the friends I've made uh, through the years at conventions and and uh, other events that um, that they've you know received me with open arms so I'm I'm, I'm as I said, I'm just very grateful for that. So thank you. Perfect. Absolutely. The honor is ours. And uh, I'm sure everyone at home watching this is saying the exact same thing as well. And again, we've only kind of tipped the iceberg. Um, you've been involved in other projects as well that have equally um, been amazing as well. And your own novel work. And uh, maybe we, we, we'll do another catch up sometime in the future as well. We'll stay connected anyway. <laughs> okay. I'd love to. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. So we get back on the show. So a, a random co- conversation with Star Trek, um, you know, because uh, you you clearly know your stuff, uh, <laughs> which is great. Uh, Maybe uh, when Discovery hits. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what we'll do there is uh, we'll uh, wrap it up for this episode of the Nerd Escape podcast. Maybe this is going to be a two parter because, you know, great conversation. We didn't want to uh, edit too much out. So um, we'll wrap it up there. And I want to thank everyone for watching. And uh, it's goodbye from me, Damien A.K. Irish Trekkie. And it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Perfect. See you, folks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, guys.